Episode 1 of Three Body Problem begins in Beijing 1966 with the infamous Cultural Revolution. A physics professor is marched out before the crowd, but he refuses to cave like the others. Instead, the authorities march his wife out after, who pleads with Ye Jete to see reason and decides to be with the people. Through all of this, their daughter, Yi Wenjai, watches helplessly from the crowd. She weeps as her pa is beaten senseless on the ground and killed. When she heads up to look over her deceased father, she gives a menacing look of revenge to the Red Guard. We then fast forward to London 2024. A bizarre murder involving a Dr. Mohammed sees a whole bunch of numbers scored up on the wall in blood. Is a countdown. Eventually, this leads round to an ominous message. I still see it. As for Mohammed, he's there on the ground and he's very much dead. Over at the Oxford University Particle Accelerator, Saul and his associate Vera lament their studies as the project they're working on is about to be shut down. The lights are on until midnight, but whatever it is that they found, it doesn't seem to abide by the rules of science and physics. Vera gives Saul some words of encouragement before leaving the room and throwing herself into a strange pool of water, killing herself in the process. Meanwhile, we get a glimpse of two other scientists, Oggy and Jin, who explained the previous scene with Saul and Vera. Apparently, a month earlier, all the major accelerators across the world started generating results that made no sense. Some of that seems to be linked to this countdown we've been seeing, but these particles aren't working in a way that we understand by the rules of science. And bizarrely, Augie seems to be infected by this. She starts to see a strange orange hue in a peripheral vision and eventually hits a crescendo when this bizarre wave turns into a countdown timer. Connecting all these scientists together is Detective Clarence Shee, who's bathed in a veil of smoke in his office. He has a pinboard up and checks out all the individual scientists. After Vera's death, he crosses her off and looks over the rest. Another new character we meet here is Jack Rooney. He's a former scientist and something of a rock star now, but he's there as a friend to attend Vera's funeral. Augie is not in the right frame of mind. In fact, she's still seeing this countdown timer everywhere. She's even seen a neurologist, but she doesn't seem to have anything wrong with her. After the funeral, Clarence is on the case. He follows a guy called Mike Evans, who happens to be part of a big company called Evans Energy. Clarence snaps photos of him as he heads out into a big field and gets a helicopter out of there. Keep an eye on this guy, he's going to be important later. As for the others, they crowd around in a small pub and discuss Vera's death and what seems to have happened to Augie. Augie leaves when Jack cracks a joke about Saul, whom we learn as history between the pair. It looks like they used to be a couple and are broken up, but we don't know the full extent of their history just yet. Augie heads out for a cigarette, where a strange woman arrives and smokes with her. She mentions a countdown and asks her how much time she has. That's not much, she says in reply, asking Augie to shut down all of her work and stop with the nanofibers. She's then told that the next day, at midnight, she's to go and look at the stars. You don't want it to get to zero. Nothing good happens at zero she says, and then leaves. She does hand over a strange token and also mentions that the stars are winking, but all of this is rather ominous. We then jump back to Inner Mongolia in China. Soldiers nearby at a base up on the hill, complete with a huge satellite dish, have apparently been working on something top secret. We're told that nothing good happens up there. The place is shrouded in secrecy, while the numerous workers down below get to work destroying the land, chopping down trees. Ye Wenji is here among them, secretly learning English. Unfortunately, she's caught by the guards, and Commander Sung demands she head off to division headquarters. While Wenji sits freezing in her cell, cuddling a thin blanket for sanctuary, a woman named Ten Lu Hua shows and tries to talk to her. Wenji's told to read a document so she can return to the construction corpse. Her task is to testify against her father's associates, who they intend to track down and presumably kill. Wenji refuses outright, and as a result, gets a bucket of cold water thrown on her and her bed for good measure. Time passes, and Wenji's work from behind bars garners interest from the scientists up at the military base on the hill. The research there is of the highest security classification, but she's allowed to rehabilitate herself there instead, given her brilliant mind. Wenji accepts and makes a bold statement that she'll spend the rest of her life there. Back in London, we jet off to the headquarters of the Strategic Intelligence Agency. It's called the Black Palace and it's where Clarence Shee has been investigating what he's dubbed the Oxford Five. He's been fired from basically every law enforcement and this is his last chance to get his career back on track. Speaking of investigating, Jin heads off to see Vera's mother, who we quickly learn happens to be Wenji. She explains that Vera never left a note or anything during her death, but seems to have been working with a games console of some sort. Jin grows curious and puts the headset on. Just like that, she's transferred inside some sort of video game. In the distance is a temple, and as the sun suddenly lifts into the air, a skeleton is revealed out of the sand and Jin screams, eventually ripping the headset off. The fateful day for Augie rolls around, and she encourages Saul to come join her as she waits for the universe to wink. Saul explains that the token she was given by that strange woman apparently stopped being made in 1963. There's a bit of banter between them until they look up at the sky and watch the stars. Saul comments on how bright they are, but when the bells ring at midnight, Augie is shocked by what she's seen as all the stars in the sky light up, and then suddenly, 
blink in and out again. This isn't an isolated incident for them though, as everyone can see this around the world. Saul realizes that this seems to be some sort of Morse code and gets to work deciphering it. And those numbers, as we quickly find out, correspond to Augie's countdown. Episode two of Three Body Problem begins with news of the unexplained blinking stars spreading across the news. Saul shows up at Vera's mum's place, who we know is Wenji, of course, and they get talking about the theory. Saul believes it's complete BS, given none of the satellites saw it, nor do they have data corresponding to it. Saul believes it may be a huge deep fake, but he's not exactly sure who could have pulled this off. Wenji definitely knows more than she's letting on here. As for Augie, she's distracted and concerned regarding the countdown timer. It's unfortunately reaching crunch time at work, and she has nine minutes left on her timer. After a successful nano experiment, Augie caves and heeds the advice given to her. She decides to shut the experiment down. As she leaves the office, the countdown stops. Her moment of peace is interrupted by Clarence Shi, who happens to be outside waiting for her, and he wants her help. Back in Mongolia in 1968, the experiments continue. They've been transmitting their message for several years now, but they've received nothing so far. UNG believes it's too weak and they need to strengthen their signal. She wants to get a Californian scientist in on the gig to help, but Yang, one of the workers there, is not sure. However, he seems to have taken a fancy to her and gets her the details to Dr. Peterson. Peterson is a genius in this field and Ye Wenji explains that his team similarly received an intense radio burst on the same day they did. It would appear that the radio wave came from Jupiter and used the sun to amplify the signal. Their theory is to use the sun in the same way to extend and amplify their radio signal to reach out across the stars. Although it could take many years, Wenji is confident it'll work and wants China at the forefront of interstellar communication. Wenji's work is stolen by Yang and passed off to Commander Li as his once again, she can't trust the men around her, but thankfully the commander doesn't think it's a good idea and reprimands a pair of them. Wenji, though, decides to rebel and actually moves the satellite across to the sun before the experiment is conducted. The others don't realise, thankfully, but she heads outside to see if it's worked. We don't actually see the outcome of this experiment, but Wenji continues to push boundaries. She finds solace in this American who shares her worldview, but the other scientists up at the Red Coast base aren't happy when they heed her advice and choose a different site to do their work. However, they do help to quench her thirst for revenge, specifically coming from the girl who lashed her father in episode one and killed him. She's lived a horrid life, with her arm being cut off after suffering from gangrene. She's now forced to do manual labor, backbreaking, horrid work. However, she still has a tough mind and refuses to repent for killing Wenji's father. Back in the present, Clarence Shi questions Augie around Vera's relationship with Mike Evans. He owns the biggest private oil company in the world, so his arrival at the funeral is certainly a point of contention. How did he know Vera? He also has stranger news too. Remember that woman from the alleyway? The one who lit Augie's cigarette? Well, Clarence has pulled the CCTV footage from that night and she doesn't exist, at least not in the footage, and it doesn't appear to have been tampered with according to their team. Someone did light Augie's cigarette, given her own lighter didn't work, so Clarence believes Augie was talking to someone but doesn't have any solid evidence right now. He also explains that the countdown is very real and appears to be a phenomenon among other scientists. All of them across the globe have quit when they see this, or quit like Vera did. Elsewhere, Jim becomes curious over the game and dons her headset again. She's approached by some NPCs, one of which happens to be called the Count of the West. He wants her to solve the riddle of this world and encourages her to choose a name. She chooses Copernicus. She has to choose when a civilization is stable or chaotic. Bizarrely, as the sun raises, follower heads out into the sun and dehydrates in the blink of an eye. Then they roll her up. What? what? When Jin takes her headset off, she encourages Jack to get involved. He puts her headset on, but when he turns around, he sees a woman approach who tells him that he's not invited and slices him up. Jack hurriedly takes the headset off, but every time he puts it back on, he gets the same result. Unbeknownst to them, Clarence has actually bugged their phone, so he hears everything they're talking about. When Jack heads back to his house, he finds a headset of his own and a card asking him to join in. The game is kind of similar to Jin's, but the NPC here is garbed in Middle English gear, and he's told to rehydrate the masses. Moisturize me, moisturize me. Jack's excitement with the game is doused when he learns Will has stage four pancreatic cancer. Jack refuses to believe this is true and encourages his friend not to give up on his own life and try to find a solution. Interestingly, when Clarence heads to the graveyard to pay his respects to his wife, that strange woman from before shows up. She laments the futility of death and asks what happened to his lover. It turns out it was breast cancer, while she explains that her own father was killed with a bullet to the head. As they both walk away, we pan down to a grave for someone called Edith Marsh. Augie tries to contact Saul, who's too busy out doing acid with some girls. Augie is not happy when he shows up at her door in the morning, sporting a blonde hair on his head too. You're a child, Saul. It's not cute anymore, Augie says, and walks away. It's clear she can't depend on him. Jin continues to become engrossed in this game, and winds up heading over to the nearby temple, where the Count has laid out a whole bunch of sticks on the ground. Jin doubts the validity of using divination to give the answers surrounding rehydrating the masses. 
Moisturize me. The Count ignores her and explains they have another eight days of the chaotic era, and when it's over, they'll have a stable era for 63 years. Zhao, believing the Count's words, asks for the sky to open up, and as it does, Jin touches the ground and exactly eight days pass, and just like that, the world is renewed. There's a glorious sea as far as the eye can see, and these dehydrated bodies are thrown into the water and rehydrated again. Jin does the honest to rehydrate follower, who's thankfully wearing clothes because the rest of the men and women are not. Unfortunately, this period of stability is completely wrong and a massive storm blows in and causes everything to turn to chaos. Follower begs Jin to help her, but as she approaches a young girl, the freezing biting winds cause her to shatter and turn to dust. The same goes for everyone else, but in the aftermath of this, a strange woman shows and explains that civilization number 137 was obliterated by extreme cold. Jin's predictions about science are correct, so she completes the level. Now that they're about to start level two, she's told she needs to use science to save the next civilization. It's only a brief glimpse, but we do see that someone seems to be watching Jin on monitors that could well be in control of this whole game. Stay tuned on that front. We then end the episode back with Ye Wen Ji in the past again. She's in the office alone at night when she notices a signal coming through from the satellite. Everyone else is asleep, but she checks the log and notices a whole bunch of numbers. This is then followed up by the incredibly ominous do not answer in Chinese symbols. If she does, then her world will be conquered. Curiosity gets the better of her and she writes out a message in reply. Come, we cannot save ourselves. I will help you conquer our world. Episode three of Three Body Problem is titled Destroyer of Worlds, which is ironic given the show creators have already destroyed one world in their filmography. <laughs> anyway, I digress. We actually begin the episode with us jetting off to Switzerland. We're at the European Council for Nuclear Research, or CERN for short. Clarence Shee shows up and learns that half a dozen projects have been abandoned and over 30 scientists killed in recent years. One of them happens to have been killed on his knees with his head in the bath. Clarence goes hunting and looks through the man's possessions. And just like that, he finds one of those headsets in the safe, grins to himself and takes it back to HQ. Meanwhile, the Oxford Five join together and discuss what's transpired so far. Will decides to take his moment and speaks to Jin alone. He has some good banter and the talking comes easy, but he doesn't open up and tell her about his cancer, nor his feelings for her. As for Augie, she wanders into Jack's bedroom and finds a headset. Just like Jack before, she puts on the headset and is slashed down. She's shocked, especially as Jin and Jack are engrossed in the game and missing the fact that Vera also played this right before she killed herself. Jack has no idea who invited him, and despite having state-of-the-art security in his complex, has no idea who showed up and placed the headset there. Saul believes it's dangerous and encourages the pair not to play anymore. After all, if this thing can hack into your brain at that level with the cells and manipulate what you do, then it may have made Vera kill herself. Augie makes the pair promise not to play, but of course they're lying. Jin is a proper keno with this game and she has a whiteboard and a whole bunch of experiments she's done. Both Jack and Jin decide to team up together in a two player mode, but the follower is there when they jump into the game. She apparently shows up in every civilization and remembers all the time she dies. Jin and Jack both show up to see the Pope and Jin explains that this is a three body star problem. <laughs> He said it! He said it! Jin explains her theory to the Pope, but he's not happy and decides to have her burned. Unfortunately, the entire world turns to chaos and burns around them. Jin and Jack are correct, though, in their assumption that this is a three-body star problem. Oh, that's why they call it that. So they themselves aren't burned to a crisp, and they move on to the next level. Meanwhile, Clarence has done some digging on this headset and found some intriguing revelations. Apparently, it has an oxygen meter, a brainwave sensor, and a retinal scanner too. It has a whole bunch of biometric data, which means that while these guys play the game, someone on the other end is playing them. It could be a recruitment tool of some kind, but for what? Outside the game, Will ends up having an operation, but whether it's the effect of the anesthesia or there's something more going on, he starts speaking in riddles. He explains that Raj, Jin's boyfriend, is chaos and always smiling, and laughs at Jack for wearing a silly hat, even though he's not actually wearing one. Meanwhile, Augie finds herself backed into a corner by her business associate. Her sponsors are pushing her to start up the nanofiber tech again. The guy is convinced that they can be the first in this field and believes Augie is having a mental breakdown. He tells her that as a CSO, she has a responsibility and if she's not going to start it up herself, well, they're going to do it without her. When Augie starts the machine up again in private, the countdown suddenly returns and she hurriedly switches it off before her timer reaches zero. She's spooked and finds Saul in a flustered state. She begs him to come over, but of course he's not alone and is with someone else in bed. Augie hangs up. Back in the game with Jin and Jack, level three begins. They're in Sangdu, where Kublai Khan hangs out. They find follower here, but she's part of the army and she's losing faith in Jin to save them. When the pair show up to see the Khan, Newton and Turing are there and it turns out they've set up the 30 million strong army down below into a specific formation of ones and zeros, binary, like a human computer. 
They hold a bunch of flags which they turn this way and that, eventually leading to what seems to be a solution. The human abacus reads that it's going to be chaos for eight months and three days. It would appear that the other two people here are also players, but Jin is convinced that it doesn't work and proves it. Given the three-body problem, the eclipse causes the army to suddenly float up into the air, given the gravitational force of the three suns. Through all of this, despite the impossible challenge, Jin realizes their true purpose is to save the people, not necessarily the world. And with that, they move on to level four. So who's actually monitoring this game? Well, it turns out Mike Evans from Vephora is the one fronting this, and he's been watching Jin and Jack closely. He wants a pair vetted for the London summit, while Mike seems to be speaking to someone on a radio. It appears to be some sort of AI or alien entity, whom he calls my lord, and the voice matches that strange woman inside the game who has been telling Jin and Jack whether they've proceeded or not. This could also link into the 60s and 70s and the message Yu Wenji sent. Anyway, Jin and Jack both received the invite to head over to the Sunset Lounge at 10pm that night in Shoreditch. The place in question is a rather run-down seedy warehouse, but Clarence watches them with interest outside as they head in. He doesn't see who they meet though, which happens to be that same strange woman who spoke to Augie in the alleyway. Apparently, all the answers to their questions can be found in level four. Placing the headsets on, level four sees that strange AI voice woman joined by the follower. They explain that with a planet full of cataclysms and chaos, there's no hope of ever keeping a civilization going for an extended period of time. There's only one solution, to flee. The pair explain that they built an interstellar fleet for civilization number 9478, and they're inbound to our planet. This civilization is called the Sangti, and the first person to make contact with them was from China. Of course, it was Ye Wenji. Sangti Ren means three-body people in Chinese. They're currently four light years away right now, but en route to Earth. Jack believes the whole thing is a scam and leaves incredulously, but Jin is into this and believes the theory is sound. Jin's loyalty is rewarded with another invite to become part of the organization to join champions from across the world. She's given a card with coordinates to her next location. We also learn more about her past and why she cares so for the Santee. It turns out Jin was ripped from her home in the past during the flood in Hubei. Meanwhile, Clarence has followed Jack and waits outside his house. As for Jack, he finds himself in somewhat of a pickle. The electrics in his house continue to blink out and after his refusal to get involved with the Santee, finds himself confronted by that strange woman who happens to be in his house. Unfortunately, free to go means something very different to the Santi people. All you had to do was keep playing, she says, and stabs him, leaving him in a bloody pool on the ground. The glass windows, however, are cracked from the force of her push. Weirdly, none of this can be seen by Clarence, who happens to be outside and watching the house closely. The woman blinks out from the camera and disappears without a trace. Episode four of Three Body Problem is where things start to fall apart at the seams both narratively and in terms of the plot development. We begin in London 1982. Ye Wenji meets with Evans. She's only there for a week as there's a conference on astrophysics and the pair are meeting for lunch. Evans admits that he's heard of her father and what happened to him. In response, Wenji has done her homework and knows about the Evans family too. She knows that he's now running his father's oil company while Ye Wenji is a professor at Tsinghua University. Evans is very different now, but Ye Wenji puts her trust in him and decides to open up all the same, mentioning that she's done something up on the hilltop. This being the communication with his auntie, of course. Back in the present, Will is discharged from hospital after his surgery. Saul shows up instead of Jack, who hasn't shown to pick him up for obvious reasons. He's, uh... Well, he's dead. But from the CCTV footage, they see him being killed, but there's nobody else on the cameras. Clarence is there too, and he explains that there are 18 cameras around the compound, and not one of them show the strange woman. Jin is visibly shaken, and she's brought in for questioning with Clarence and his boss, Thomas Wade. He wants Augie to stop working, but for Jin to go ahead and accept the invite, going undercover and finding those who killed Jack. Jin is rattled, and she believes the Santee are real and on their way here. While this is going on, Thomas Wade and Clarence are tracked down Mike Evans, who happens to be on the ship near the Mediterranean Sea. This is his base of operations, where he seemingly communicates with Asante via radio. His lord wants that his enemies know exactly where he is. She promises to protect him and comments on his smile, hinting that Asante can actually see him. It is rather unnerving, and even more so when Evans reads Little Red Riding Hood to it. Given the story is based on deceptions and lies, concepts foreign to the Santi race, they end up afraid of him and believe him and humanity in general to be a liar. As a result, they stop communicating with him completely. Jin goes ahead and begins infiltrating the society. Wade warns her not to bring her phone and to turn it off. Lo and behold, she parks up and meets with those involved in the Santi. They drive Jin up to the conference hall full of other people who completed the game. Wade and Clarence listen in and decide to sit tight while Jin listens to the founder, Dr. Ye Wenji, steps out and revels in the applause. Clarence realizes that the Santi have been controlling everything the group has seen seeing and hearing thus far. So why are they allowing them to see the truth of Vera's mother? According to Ye Wenji, the Santi will show up in 400 years time, but her speech is interrupted by Wade's men storming the place and keeping everyone under armed guard. Boy, that escalated quickly. 
I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Wenji tells him not to interject and to comply with the soldiers' wishes. As each of them are cable-tied, Wenji believes that the Lord will protect them. However, that strange woman from before, who we later learn is actually called Tatiana, is in attendance, and when she notices Jin on the way out, gunfire erupts, and all hell breaks loose. Clarence shows and protects Jin, while Ye Wenji simply sits and watches all of this play out. The casualties are numerous in the aftermath, but Tatiana manages to get herself out of trouble, as we see her crawling over the grass in the dark, away from the carnage. Why don't you just die? Meanwhile, inside the ambulance, Jin receives a call from Will. They discuss meeting up and chilling down on the Seven Sisters coastline, but when he learns she's inside an ambulance, Will wants to know what's going on. And just like that, Jin spills her guts and reveals everything that's transpired so far. We then have a brief intermission where we jump back to 1984. Evans and Ye Wenji show up on the heli carrier we've been seeing so much of. It turns out that the Santee have been trying to communicate with her all this time. They've been sending messages across and Evans confirms that it's all real and they're coming. Their talking soon turns to kissing. In the present, Wade confronts Ye Wenji about the ship and asks about Judgment Day. Wenji turns it around and points out that the Santee are incredibly powerful and he has no idea how until they arrive. Wenji turns it around and points out that the Santee are incredibly powerful and he has no idea how much so until they arrive. You'll be so grateful, she smiles, as the episode comes to an end. Episode 5 of Three Body Problem begins with Wade and Raj verbally sparring with one another. As a result of his tenacity, Wade decides to bring him on to his operation, claiming that there's something far more important than protecting his country. This stems from stopping the ship that Evans is on, the one he's communicating with the Santee from, by any means necessary. They get this intel from Clarence, who speaks to Wenji about her message she sent back in the 70s. She doesn't regret sending it over, claiming that humanity needed to be saved. She's compliant with Clarence's questions, believing that she doesn't matter anymore. All that matters is that the Santi are coming. Apparently, Wenji tried to protect Vera from this whole alien ordeal, and here we learn that Evans is her father. I am shocked! Shocked! Well, not that shocked. However, he never met her, and the first time he did was at the funeral. Wenji was the one who recruited Jin to the cause. But how are they communicating with the Santi so quickly? Well, the clue may well be on this state-of-the-art ship we'll be seeing, and its name, Judgment Day. According to Wenji, there is communication that's available that's faster than light speed. It may be impossible for us, but not for the aliens. In order to find out the truth, Clarence realises they need to look at the ship. One easy way of doing that is to use this nanofibre tech Augie has been working on. Clarence speaks to Augie and they head off to the lab. Augie downs a tonne of alcohol before switching the machine back on, knowing that the countdown is imminently going to reach zero. This time though, when she turns the machine on, there is no countdown. She rushes over and hugs Clarence with relief, until she wonders exactly why the numbers have stopped. Clarence believes it's because the Lord has stopped protecting its flock. Clarence and Augie next head off to see Wade, who briefs a whole bunch of naval officers about something they're building. Raj is one fronting this project, and it's super secret. They figured out that a Judgment Day ship is en route to the Panama Canal, and will be there in about 26 hours or so. This project, using nanotech, is going to kill numerous people. Augie is not happy that Raj is on board with this mission, but he justifies it by saying they're at war. Over in Panama, Augie's nanotech works and it cuts everyone on board, destroying all the tech and equipment along with slicing up every single passenger. It's an absolute bloodbath. As for Evans, he faces death head on and clutches a strange red contraption, asking for forgiveness before dying. In the wreckage, Clarence and Wade find the red box, which is completely unharmed somehow, and realise that the information there is far too intelligent and sophisticated for them to crack anytime soon. According to one of the engineers, it will take about 38 billion years time. Ironically, this is also the release date for Half-Life 3. Out of nowhere, something blinks up on the monitor before him. The Santee clearly want them to see what's inside, and they find 28 gigabytes of text and media files. There's a strange file type too that's 100 petabytes, which is 100 million gigabytes in size. Wade shows back up to see Wenji, and shows off a recorder that he has. This details everything that went on between Evans and the Santee, including the infamous liar conversation. Wenji is shocked when she hears this, realising that the aliens may actually be turning hostile after all. Elsewhere, a lawyer shows up on the south coast to see Will, to confirm that half of Rooney estate has been given to him, which amounts out to a toasty amount of about 20 million. Will isn't exactly happy about this, as he doesn't want to be poked and prodded by scientists looking for a cure for his cancer, which is something that Jack wanted for him. Instead, he tells Saul all he wants is to eat some good food and enjoy the stars. Wade shows up to see Jin and asks about higher dimensions. She understands the concept, so he brings her into HQ. There are two headsets there place for the pair of them. Wade and Jim both put them on and are whisked away to the game world. This shows off a post-apocalyptic wasteland and that strange AI woman from before. This AI woman is concerned that humanity is advancing far faster than she could foresee and believes the fleet is a funeral procession just waiting to happen. The Santi are afraid of humanity and want to destroy our science from the inside out, using their sophons, which are protons that they've turned into a sentient computer, to do their bidding for them. She explains that there are way more dimensions than the eye can see and they've managed to use these to mess with the very foundations and fabric 
of how we see the world. They can make a mind as large as the world and then shrink it right back down again. They've created four siphons in total, two pairs of two. Each pair is entangled and connected on a quantum level. There are two on Earth and two that remain with the Santee. Given that they have no mass, propelling them through space faster than the speed of light was pretty easy for them and they entered the solar system months ago at the best scientific places on the world. This is their plan to kill science and wrap our world in illusions, distorting what we see with countdowns and doomsday prophecies. It is worth noting that thankfully Professor Cox was absolutely fine through all of this. The Santee threat is very real though and to show how much power the Siphons have, all the electronic devices devices begin blinking out, only to be replaced by one universal message in languages across the world. You are bugs. And just like that, a strange veil hangs over the sky, with a great eye looking down on everyone. So this was a good idea, was it? And reflecting everything from below. Mass Panic Worldwide is where we start episode 6 of Three Body Problem. It's a procedure! Stay Militaries have been deployed across the world to try and control the rioting, which has reached fever pitch. The UN attempt to control the narrative, but it doesn't seem to be working. No surprise there. Mandatory curfews are in place, and while some religious sects have jumped on this and begin worshipping their new alien overlords, others are taken to hanging themselves, with bodies strung all the way down the Thames. Jin shows up to see Ye Wenji who remembers a message from the Red Guard back in the day. Posters demanding they forge a new world. Jin is livid, calling her a traitor and leaving her in this room alone. We then jump across to Witchwood Manor. Wade and the other soldiers have set up a meeting to try and come up with some sort of plan to defeat the Santee. Given the Sophons are all around them, many doubt the validity of their moves, wrapped in paranoia and distrust. Wade believes they need to keep working on advancing their research regardless of what's happening, while simultaneously going after the Santee and taking the fight to them. Specifically, he's intending to to send up a probe to intercept the enemy fleet. They need to know about their plans, but doing so would be way too long a mission, given it would take 398 years to reach them. Wade heads off to speak to Jin, and asks her to come up with a solution to this for them. Jin is shocked, but heads up to the manor all the same and presents her ideas to the group. She wants to use their nuclear weapons to conduct something called a nuclear pulse propulsion. Basically, their ship would use a radiation sail to be propelled after a series of atomic bombs are blasted out in space. This is the easiest way for them to hit towards their light speed goal, but the others don't agree with her proposal. Not only is it a really Really expensive endeavour, the margin for error is incredibly small. They believe they still have 400 years and time is on their side. Wade, however, doesn't share their lackadaisical attitude. In his office, Raj shows up and wants to be part of the Space Fleet team, given he has a background in nuclear engineering. He speaks his case pretty passionately and Wade nonchalantly tells him he should have come to him when he first heard of this several years back. Raj is quite taken aback, but Wade does allow him to be part of the group, specifically that of the team building the base up on the moon. Augie joins Will and Sol on the beach as they comment how terrible England is for their beaches. And as a Brit, yes. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. He's out of line, but he's right. What? What the f After all of her drama with Wade and the others, Jin shows up with a housewarming gift, which happens to be a goldfish in a bowl. When Augie finds out that Jin is working with Wade, she pleads her not to. She believes that this is all leading to another Hiroshima and warns against her work. Jin does eventually leave in the morning, with things still pretty tense between them, after a beautiful chat with Will down by the water, ending in her placing a paper origami boat in the water. Will, again, misses his chance to tell her how he feels. With Jin gone, Sol and Augie suggest he go and spill his heart out later that day, and ignore Raj who's having his own issues connecting with Jin, given their top secret plan. So you're telling me there's a chance? Yeah! Will gets a train all the way up to London, shows up at a door, and notices Raj and Jin together, and he changes his mind, and goes back to the south coast again. Unbelievable. He seems relatively calm. He's realised Augie is the one Jin needs, and comments how amazing and awesome she is. Meanwhile, Florence shows up to see Ye Wenji and demands the truth. He wants to know exactly why Vera jumped. It turns out Vera actually intercepted messages between her and Evans on her phone. She didn't even leave a note and just outright killed herself. It's apparently not because of the aliens or her work, it was just because of the shame with her mum sleeping with Mike Evans. Ye Wenji is allowed to go eventually, but Clarence is keeping a tight leash on her, deciding to watch everywhere she goes by having a tail planted on her. As it turns out, Ye Wenji simply gets the train and goes back home. Augie shows up to see Jin and decides to work with her after all. And while this is happening, Will heads down into the water and sees a sign coming in the form of several paper origami boats, just like what Jin showed him. As a result, Will shows up at the donating centre we heard about earlier in the episode, during a conversation about the woes of the rich. This company is called The Stars Our Destination, and he decides to buy a star. And that is where the episode ends. 
The penultimate episode to Three Body Problem begins with Saul talking to Will about the star that he's bought. It's 401 light years away and apparently Will did this so Jin can look up and see it. When Saul heads inside, Will passes out and he's brought into hospital. Whilst there, his family show and discuss his health. At the same time, Jin and Raj discuss Will's acquisition of the star for her. But at this point, she's not actually aware he's the one who did it. She even has a nice little plaque too. Anyway, that's not the most pressing of issues here. Well, obviously... In the lab, they've frozen a chimpanzee and have used this as an experiment to see if they can do the same thing for a person. And it's a success. Kolya, the chimp, is super smart and shows off its intelligence on the screen. Wade wants a human volunteer and he believes Will is the perfect person for that role. Augie and Jin contemplate how ethical all of this is while simultaneously continuing their work. They try to dissuade Wade, but it doesn't work. In fact, when he mentions Will, something triggers in his mind and he hurries off to make a call. He rings some and asks him to spearhead a new project which he wants everyone on board with. He mentions the term wolf facer and not much else. Fret not though, we learn more about this in the finale and presumably in season two as well. If Netflix decide to greenlight a renewal, of course. <laughs> Augie and Jin's work on this radiation cell works, but it's all too much for Augie who decides to leave. Again. And when she does, she finds that Denny's, her sponsor back at the nanofiber work, has booted her from the nano project and has taken it for himself. Augie has the last laugh though, as she decides to leak everything on WikiLeaks and make it completely public for everyone. Augie plays the man's game and leaves a smouldering ruin in her wake. And then we're back at the hospital again. Jin shows up and talks to Will about the staircase project that Wade wants him involved in. Will eventually does open up after seven long episodes and tells Jin the truth that he loves her. It's about damn time. She starts crying and he tries consoling her. However, he eventually decides not to sign his contract, believing his loyalty isn't to humanity, but to Jin. Wade won't take no for an answer though and decides he's perfect, pointing out that he'll be in touch shortly. At the same time, we cut across to Ye Wen Ji, who reminisces on old times before deciding to do something drastic. She picks up the phone and calls Saul. <laughs> They head to the graveyard together and pay their respects to Vera. She also reinforces how smart Saul is and questions why he's working for someone else when he's bright enough to do it alone. Remember the strange woman from before, the one who crawled away in the grass? Well, it's here in episode seven that we learn that her name is Tatiana. She's holding out in a caravan somewhere and the Santi communicate directly to her through the TV. They tell her that she's part of them and something much larger than herself. It's all very ominous, but we'll get to that later. Back at the hospital, Saul and Will talk. When Jin learns from Wade that Will was the one who brought her a star, she rushes to the hospital. Saul tries to convince Will against signing his life away, worrying that the Santee will use him as a science experiment and potentially turn him into a lifeless corpse. None of those words seem to do the trick and Will does eventually sign his life away. When Jin shows up at the hospital, she's too late. He's not there. Ye Wen Ji heads to the airport next and realises her tail is on her and decides to switch seats to be next to him. She explains it's a long trip and she could do with someone to talk to. The pair do eventually show up in Mongolia, up at the army base from all those years ago. The place is a complete mess though and abandoned. The satellite has been destroyed, no longer functioning like it was before. Ye Wen Ji stands on the edge of the cliff and looks set to jump until Tatiana shows up. Tatiana encourages Ye Wen Ji not to jump, pointing out that she won't die straight away if she does and it's a rather nasty fall. This seems to do the trick and Tatiana even offers a gentle and painless death. Before Ye Wenji is killed, the pair sit and watch the sunset together. You've worked so hard, for so long. You deserve a rest, Tatiana says, as the episode comes to a close. Episode 8 of Three Body Problem begins its finale with Saul at home smoking while listening to the news about the alien invasion. He's embraced the idea of humanity being bugs and has turned back into his old player ways, bringing home a random girl to sleep with. He doesn't even know her name. When he heads outside of his day, talking cynically about the human race, a strange twist of fate occurs. Saul is knocked off the pavement by someone skating past and this chain of events results in a silver Prius, the Uber driver Saul called for his date, smashing straight into her. And as she lies on the ground, crumpled and bleeding, Saul remembers her name. Unbelievable. Saul is brought in for questioning with Clarence, who knows he met Ye Wenji and wants to know what's going on. It turns out Wenji is dead, and it was a self-driving car that ploughed into Nora. It seems like they were originally targeting Saul, with the they seemingly being the Santee. As a result of this, Saul is given bulletproof clothes and taken over to New York, where he's brought into the United Nations. The men and women there are prepping for a big ceremony for Saul to be part of the Wolf Facer project. This is a big meeting, with minds from every nation joined together in a pretty dark room, and they need to work out how 
to defeat the Santee. Given these aliens can't read their minds, but are in every facet of humanity, the United Nations have chosen three people to concoct a plan to take out the Santee. They are the ones that are called the Wallfacers. These guys and girls will be able to exploit every resources needed across the planet without having to explain their actions or what resources they want, no matter how unethical or crazy it may be. In fact, they're going to come up with the plan in their mind. Okay. These three are General Hal, Professor Layla, and Saul. After the attack on Saul's life, that's why he's chosen for this position. They know that he's important to the Santee. Saul rejects outright and decides to leave alone. However, when he steps outside, he's shot in the shoulder and drops to the ground. Clarence is there in a flash and rings Wade, letting him know what's happened while bringing him back inside for medical attention. Saul is okay, thankfully, although he does have a broken rib and he was shot by a sniper. Clarence is there when he wakes up and smiles mischievously at him when he says he's not a wall facer. Saul is big news and eventually he's left with the shooter who is brought in before him. He apologizes for not shooting Saul in the head, but Saul points out that he's not a wall facer again. Given Asante know about the lies of humanity, they refuse to believe him. And this shooter is something of a fanatic and believes in the Lord's work, clearly working for the Santee. I am shocked, shocked. Well, not that shocked. Jin shows up to see Wade with a bunch of seeds and wants them placed in the staircase capsule with him. Wade refuses, and although Jin threatens to leave and find someone more senior, Wade calls her bluff and points out there is nobody higher than him. Along with the rest of the crew, Jin slots into place begrudgingly and prepares for their mission to take place. Saul also decides to go along, and as he now has the resources for everyone across the planet, he manages to get there without much of an issue. Together with Jin, they're going to watch Will be jetted off into space, and he meets up with her at ground control. While all this is going on, we catch up with Tatiana, Why don't you just die? who is off in the woods hiding out. She receives another headset from someone, and there's a note inside that says, if one of us survives, we all survive. She puts the headset on and prepares to play. Saul shows up to see Jin, and they see off Will, who is blasted into space. The pair discuss his choice to go, and Saul reinforces just how much Will loved her. One person not here is Augie. She's actually over in Mexico, using her nanofibers to do good work. She helps to give clean water to the locals, and when she hears her phone go off, she checks it out and realizes it's a call from Saul. She doesn't answer. Saul, realizing he's not going to be able to get through to Augie, goes back inside with Jin and the others as they watch Will's ship blast up into space. The experiment seems to work for a while at least. Unfortunately, the trajectory deviates from its initial path and the rocket jets off in the wrong direction. Wade whispers something to Jin on the way out the door while the group are left to wallow in their mistakes. The project is a failure. Wade jets off on his plane afterwards all alone. However, the electronics start glitching out and on the screen, that familiar AI from before shows. It's the Sophon. They apologized for the staircase project being a failure, but Wade is apparently part of their master plan. They've recognized that he's a strong leader and have decided that from here on out, they're going to be watching him, influencing everything he does until the day he dies. Meanwhile, Saul and Jin join Clarence as they marvel over the irony of humanity being called bugs. After all, humans have been trying to get rid of them forever and they're not going anywhere. I'm sorry, was that your auntie? And after pouring some alcohol on the ground, which is a metaphorical toast to humanity, the trio head off as the series comes to a close. Thanks for watching, and do let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Smash a like or subscribe to the channel, your support is very much appreciated. I'm Greg Wheeler, and from all of us over here at The Review Geek, we'll see you on the next video.